Hello and welcome to the Machine Learning Podcast, the podcast about going from idea to delivery with machine learning. Your host is Tobias Macy, and today I'm interviewing Colin Priest about applying generative AI to the task of building and deploying AI and ML pipelines. So Colin, can you start by introducing yourself? Hi, I'm Colin. I'm an Australian living in Singapore, and I work for FeatureBuy as the Chief Evangelist funny tech title, but what it means is I'm looking after customer success. I'm spreading the word of how feature engineering is very important and how it can be done better. And do you remember how you first got involved in the area of machine learning? Oh, that's one of my favorite stories. I started out my career as an actuary in an insurance company and I was doing pricing and underwriting and so on. And I'd go into the management meetings and every time I'd go in, I'd get ambushed by the marketing manager. And the marketing manager very quickly became my enemy. And he'd always go, you're setting the prices too high. Uh, Very easy to blame. We're not making budget because you set the prices too high, not because he doesn't know how to market. And I knew I hadn't set the prices too high, but I'd lose every time because he was in marketing and he was better at talking than me. And then one day I got very annoyed and I went back to my office and I slammed the door. And it's like, what can I do about this? And I'd been reading Sun Tzu, The Art of War. And it's like, don't let the enemy choose the battleground. And he chosen words as the battleground. And I thought, well, what's my strength? My strength is data and analysis. So what could I do with some data and some analysis that would show him was wrong? And I figured out, this is back in 1995. It's a long time ago, and I'm showing my age now. I figured out how to build a model to predict whether someone accepted a quote, because we, I'd started getting a new data feed from a call center where people would call in, give the details, we'd give them a quote, and they'd say, yes, I want to buy, or no, I don't want to buy. And it very quickly showed that you could go up or down about 10% in the price before it made much difference at all to whether someone bought the product. And it particularly so if you offered them a monthly premium. Because people have that cognitive bias. They don't multiply by 12 and go, no, it's it's an annual amount. They go, well, that's only a small dollar amount. So that's how I started out. And then I just gradually got more and more involved. I started building neural networks, very, very, very simple ones back then. Later on, I realized that if I wanted to do price elasticity, I had to get lots of premium quotes so I could figure out what was going on. And one of the insurers put their prices inside an image so that you couldn't get it. And so then I had to figure out how to do my own OCR. And it just gradually moved on from there. And then I expanded beyond insurance. And I haven't worked in insurance for about 10 years now. Yeah, yeah it's, it's always fun hearing how people get faced with a particular problem and will take engineering and problem solving and figure out how am I going to bring these skill sets to bear? How can I then leverage that into you know successive levels of complexity and build a career out of that? And it's turned full circle because now part of my role is marketing and going from marketing being the enemy to marketing is what I do. But that's also what we've seen the industry do in general. Uh, Marketing has become much more a data driven profession than it was back then. Absolutely. And so bringing us now to the topic for today, can you just start by giving the 30,000 foot view of the steps that are involved in building an AI and ML pipeline, and then we can start picking it apart from there? Sure. And, And some people may do it differently to me. Everyone has their own way, and that's the only way you should do it. But coming from more of a business background than an engineering background, I always like to start with properly defining the problem. I've seen too many people solve the wrong problem. And I want to start with the business problem, not the mathematical problem. And I want to understand how the business works. I want to understand how the data was generated. I want to understand what they're going to do with the prediction. Uh, Is it a prediction they want? Is it a decision that they want? What are the costs and benefits of, of errors one way or another? And I like that because I get to learn things every time I do that. And I get to talk to real people, not just to data scientists. Then, and this is where people might take different pathways. I start with feature ideation. 
even before I've looked at the actual data. Now, some people like to look at the data first, but I like to go, what data, if I could have any data in the world, what would I like to get? Because sometimes, if you only just think about what you've got, you don't go and go, oh, wait a sec, there is some other data, like I did with the price elasticity. There was a new data source, and I stopped and thought, ah, I can use that instead of my traditional data. And so I do that first. Now, to be fair, there's a lot of iterating back and forth when you then go and her, what data do we have? What does it actually mean? And then you go back and you, you do some ideation of that, and then you go, wait a sec, could I link it to this? And so th there's a lot of backing and forth and about that. Then you've got to build those features. I gotta say that's one of the most painful things to do. I can code, I can do Python, I can do R, I can do SQL. I'm not gonna pretend that I can write production code because I'm a data scientist, not an engineer. But you, know, you, you start prototyping the things, you start to see what they look like and then you discover more things about the data you didn't realize. Why are there missing values here? Why is this price negative? <laughs> uh, there's things like that. Then it's, let's run some experiments. Let's feed it into a machine learning model and see what it does with it. Once again, you discover more things about the data that you hadn't realized. Uh, why did it just do that? You know? um, and then you try and optimize, which is which features am I gonna have? And what I want, is a diverse set of features. I don't want too many because it becomes unmanageable. I don't want too few because then the model is just going to underfit. And so I try and find some diversity there and we tune that. Then we get to the difficult bit, which is deploying. All the courses stop at this point of time. All the, the data science competitions stop at this point of time. How do you get a production quality data feed that runs off live data? Because typically I've been working off snapshots until then. How do I get the machine learning algorithm into production as well? How do I connect that all up? How do I then get the output of that to actually make decisions? Is there a decision rules engine? Or do I have to write some more code at the other end? Now, I've oversimplified that a lot. But as you'll notice, a lot of it was about the data and about learning more about the data. Absolutely. And I appreciate that your starting point is what is the problem that we are actually trying to solve? Because as you alluded to, engineers, people who are very steeped in the code and the technology will often try to approach it from the, oh, I have this tool, so this is my hammer, so I'm just going to go ahead and pound on that nail until it lays somewhat flat. <laughs> yes, yes. And, and particularly, I, I've looked at a number of marketing problems and people some, often solve the wrong marketing problem. Uh, which is which people have bought this product in the past. But often that's not what you want. It's who will buy it if I try and sell it to them now. Um, and so it's who will respond to a marketing campaign, not who would buy it regardless of whether there's a marketing campaign. And so now, given the rough framework of these are the steps involved in the pipeline, in your experience and in your work with customers at FeatureByte, what do you see as the stages in that process that are prone to repetition and therefore amenable to automation? So almost everything is prone to repetition, but everything's different. It's one of those horrible things. Because every problem is different, you're going to come up with a different set of features to solve it. But if you're going to be efficient about this, you're going to try and reuse some of those features and reuse some code. Some things are just boilerplate. If you're doing anything with a customer, one of the first features you want to use is their age. You don't want to have to recode that every time you use it. Similarly, where do they live? You don't want to recode that. You might have had it geocoded somewhere. Feature ideation is something that you, you do iterate and iterate and iterate. You can't do it on the margins, you can't do it a single feature at a time. Because as I was saying before, what you want is a diverse set of features. And what I find is people just keep coming up with the same type of feature with just tiny little variations. Now, you've also got to align the data with the unit of analysis. So there's a, there's a ton of aggregation you have to do. And for different problems, you might aggregate the feature at different levels. It might be at customer level or it might be at product level. There's different levels you could do that. The feature selection, 
there's a lot, and, and there's, there's definitely repetition in that because it's once again, it's an iterative process. I've seen people do that entirely manually. I've seen people do that just using uh, feature importance and I'll just pick the top N and I'll try a few different Ns. I've seen people try and really optimize that and use genetic algorithms. There, there's a lot of things there. And then you get to the deployment, and this is where I do think there's a lot more opportunity to make things repetitious by, by making them standardized, because it's just too hard to deploy if everything is bespoke. So given the fact that there are opportunities for automation, there are repetitive elements, but there is also a lot of nuance and detail within some of those cycles of repetition, what are some of the features that are available in the current generation of generative AI models that lend themselves to helping with some of that work without necessarily fully automating it? But what are some of the ways that that generative AI can be brought to bear and accelerate the capabilities of the humans doing the work? Yeah. So I'm going to take a step back just before the Gen AI. You've, if you want to make things that you can reuse, you're going to have to standardize them. So you're going to have to standardize the way the data looks, the way you interpret it, and the way that you manipulate it. And I'm going to take through those steps. So the first thing is, what, what's the data look like? That's actually a well-solved problem. You've got data warehouses, for example. You've got data dictionaries. But the understanding of the data that's where we're starting to see new products coming out there and, the, and the, the rise of the semantic layer. So more than this column contains a numeric uh, that's a floating point. It is, well, no, this column is actually the paid price. It is non-negative. <laughs> and it's at this unit level. It's for, a, it's for a specific product or it's the invoice total. It's gross or net of GST and... That level of semantic, having that in there, saves you a lot of unnecessarily manual repetition, and it saves you key man risk as well. When someone leaves and they're the only one that understood what that data meant. Now, Gen AI can help you do that tagging. We have found it to be pretty good, actually, at doing that, particularly if you've got a data dictionary that has a freeform text that describes what the column is what it contains, and you give it some uh, metadata about the contents of the column. So I found that to be particularly useful, and, and but what you've got to have is an ontology uh, for it to do that. If you just give it free form, it doesn't really help you much. So that comes back to that standardization. Now, you're going to override that at times. For example, I did that yesterday. I was looking at some telco data, and one of the fields was the number of dependents that the customer had, dependents aged under 18. And Gen AI said, this is a lookup attribute. Uh, it came from a slowly changing dimension table. And that was correct, but I knew more about that. And, and in the ontology, I went down further and I said, this is actually a head count, which was one in our ontology, there's a thing called a head count. Uh, now it knows that this is a number of people. So we can do that. The next stage along is feature ideation. Once again, you've got to try and standardize how you present this. Uh, you need uh, to have a description of the use case. You should be defining the unit of analysis and that'll be an entity or, or a, a combination of entities. And then um, you want to generate some features. Now, if you do that, I, I, I've seen a number of tools out there that brute force feature generation and you literally end up with thousands of features. And that's not a good thing. Uh, I remember trying a few years ago to help a bank. Uh, they had, I think they had 5,000 features to be generated and they're going, our validation team is never gonna let us use any more than 25. <laughs> and we don't have time to look at all 5,000. So one of the things we've started uh, doing is asking Gen AI uh, to, within the context of a use case, and with the description of a feature, so you've got to have a description, you've got to have some characteristics, some standard characteristics, rank it for this use case. Uh, so that I can start to see what are the top 50 or so from common sense perspective, not from feature importance yet, that's a separate problem, 
but can you start to just rank these for me and throw out the ones that make no sense? Um, so like, you know, you could, I, and I saw one by a brute force that it said time since the last time they changed gender. And it's like, that's not going to be a very helpful feature. <laughs> um, yet it had come out of brute force. Yeah, so that's something that saves me a ton of work. Now, I still need to go and use my domain knowledge because Gen AI only knows generic info. It doesn't know this specific business. It doesn't know how exactly the data was collected, how it's being used, the exact categories, if it's a categorical field. But, it, oh, my goodness, it saves me a lot of trouble. We've also been starting to use Gen AI to create the description of the feature uh, based upon the metadata about the feature. And that's proving pretty good for talking to the business people. And as data scientists, we keep wanting to use maths when we talk to people and, and the eyes glaze over. My wife is a fashion designer. If I start talking about my work, you can see she's not listening. You know? uh, but you know, same with business people. What they really want to know is what does this mean, not what was the mathematical calculation. And so we're doing a bit of that. And that saves, every time I show this to a data scientist, they go, oh, thank goodness. I hate doing that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, to me, they're, they're there where we've started doing some stuff. There's some other stuff out there. Um, I recently saw a demo from Data Robot, and they're using Gen AI to help uh, explain the machine learning models, their behaviors, what's important, how to interpret the diagnostics. Once again, a really useful thing. So you don't have to be a PhD to, to look and go, Is, does this model make any sense? So you know, in general, it's like, using Gen AI for general knowledge and using it to turn jargon into plain language and vice versa. Yeah, definitely is interesting that we are able to use the generative AI models to use their semantic mappings as a means of being able to assign the semantic relevancy to information and be able to bring together those things like ontologies and data dictionaries and try to figure out what are the appropriate rankings. But also because of the fact that we are using these models to be able to say, okay, these are the pieces of information you need to be paying attention to. And those are the things that are going to have a substantial impact on the final product, on the final model that is going to be business critical what are the steps of validation and verification that need to be incorporated into that overall development cycle by the people who are leading that AI model to make sure that the information that it's giving is actually accurate, particularly given the fact that these generative AI models have a tendency to the generally accepted term is hallucinate, but at least to provide answers with confidence that are not factually correct. Yeah, yeah. So there's a few things you can do. So as we were saying before, it's really important that you standardize a number of things so that you constrain the problem. The more constrained the problem, the more likely you are to notice when Gen AI is doing something silly. And the more you constrain it, the less opportunity it has to do something silly. And it's not just the Gen AI that can do something silly. Uh, the human operator can as well. So to give you an example, Earlier this week, I was working on some telco data and I forgot in the use case to say that this churn problem was for telco prepaid, no, sorry, postpaid cell phone accounts. So we didn't even know it was telco. So it just generated a bunch of features for me that didn't make sense because that's not how a telco works. <laughs> um, so you can't just accept things on face value. So one of the things you should look, and if you can get the Gen AI to tell you why it suggested something, that's a really good thing to go through. Read the explanation and express skepticism if it doesn't make sense. Now, you might be wrong or it might be wrong, but at least raise those things. The other thing is it's always good to have an independent validation of not just your model, but your feature engineering. I, I see 
you know, in the regulated industries like banking, they, they fuss a lot about the model and they forget to check whether the, the data pipeline makes sense as well. So having someone independent look at it helps as well. And, and another thing I've, I've started experimenting with is when it recommends something, go and test it. Uh, what was the feature importance? If it says this is important, was it actually important? And vice versa. If I've got something that's important and it says it's not, I'm going to flag that as well because maybe there's something wrong with my data pipeline and I've got target leakage or something silly like that. Another element of validation and verification beyond a human going through line by line and checking saying, yep, that makes sense or nope, that's completely bonkers. There's also in the engineering discipline, the concept of unit testing and integration testing and yeah. having some automated validation. I'm curious, what are the opportunities and limitations of being able to apply some of those principles? So we do that. We don't use Gen AI to do that, I've got to say. Um, and, and I think that's a good thing. Uh, looking at things completely different ways is how you find problems. So we defined a whole bunch of standard tests and we've chatted to some companies that already have some of their own as well. And they, and they use GitHub and they've, you know, they've automated some of these tests. You need to be able to do that you know, um, uh, so that what you're testing is being done a different way to the way it was generated. So you can have unit testing for how, how fast does this feature get generated. It's no good having something for a live use case if the feature takes too long to calculate or even worse the data isn't available at that time because you're using a data warehouse and it's refreshed once a day now we deal with some of that a different way we we, we put in guardrails that are all time aware so that um, it doesn't matter what the gen ai says it can't do we just don't let it do certain things one thing that's really important too is to be able to identify downstream effects and that's why once again having a really good structure around everything matters if you have free-for-all in how you code feature engineering it's impossible for you to track downstream consequences and, and so you know data data scientists may get a bit upset oh yeah restricting this and this and this but the moment they have to go and debug why something broke they'll start to realize why that's happening Another thing is you want to abstract away as much complexity as possible. Make everything standard modules, standard categories, so that a human can look at it and instantly get what it's doing. They don't have to go through spaghetti SQL. I've got to say, I, I, I could never debug SQL. It's just beyond me. <laughs> and, and I speak to data engineers that it's not beyond them, but they hate it. <laughs> Absolutely. Going back to the sequence of steps that you outlined at the beginning of figure out what is the business problem, go through the feature ideation, do some of the feature engineering, start to experiment, optimize, productionize. I'm wondering of those steps, if there are any that you find people leaning on the generative AI more and what are the cases where people rely on their own engineering acumen or intuition and say, if I try to bring the generative mm -hmm. AI in for this part of it, then I'm just going to get a whole bunch of garbage. Yeah, so there's pluses and minuses both ways. Uh, so like one of the innovative things that I saw was in a huge health tech company in the US. And they get doctor's notes, which are all freeform text. And they're, they're using Gen AI to read it and answer and turn thing and pull out structured features from that. So in amongst all this text, somewhere the doctor wrote what the patient's temperature was. Excellent. Yeah, you know, it's much better than uh, trying to force the doctors to fill in things. So they, they don't like change. Um, on the other hand, that caused problems because they were using a generic uh, Gen AI. Um, it might have been ChatGPT. It might have been Copilot. I don't know which. But the problem is because it was an external one, the provider would do version changes over time they lost replicability. And so that was a problem with using Gen AI. Um, another problem is that Gen AI, and come back to replicability again, even if you haven't had a version change, 
uh, Gen AI is stochastic. Uh, you can ask the same question twice and get two different answers. Uh, one of the tricks I've seen one data scientist do is to ask the Gen AI multiple times and look for the most common answer out of those. <laughs> But I do like the idea of using Gen AI to turn unstructured data into structured features. In that overall workflow of pipeline design, development, deployment, incorporating generative AI into the different inner loops of that cycle, what are some of the aspects of the developer experience that you have had to consider and that need to be addressed to make sure that the incorporation of generative AI into that flow is an enhancement and an accelerant to that process and not something that is going to detract from the overall experience or bring people out of their state of flow. One, one thing that's just vital for keeping data scientists engaged is to let them see and edit anything that gets created. It's no good just saying the AI created this, you should accept it. Data scientists are too skeptical to do that. And plus their, their egos say, I've got to make a change to it so I can add value. Now, often that is value. So the Gen AI only knows generic knowledge. I, at one telco, I spoke to one of the senior data scientists and he says, would it do this? And I'm going, no, nah, it doesn't know how to do that. He says, and what it was, was they were doing churn. And once again, on cell phones, these were prepaid cell phone accounts so the opposite time. And, and he said he knew that if someone was topping up frequently on small amounts, there were a much higher churn risk than if they topped up infrequently with large amounts. But the Gen AI didn't know to do that. So he says, how do I do that? And I says, let it generate a generic one for you. Now let's get it to spit out the code for what it just did and we can go and edit that oh thank you, you know? uh, that's what you need to be able to do uh, I hate black boxes that, that firstly don't tell me what they're doing and secondly don't let me edit it for things that I know when it doesn't and now beyond just the steps of doing the problem statement feature development, experimentation, you then say, okay, I've got a model training pipeline. I think this is going to work. I'm ready to put it into production. What are some of the elements of productionization, ongoing monitoring, retraining, where the generative AI can also be applied to that set of loops? I've got to say that that's something that's not as mature yet, but there are things you can do. So as I mentioned before, having the Gen AI explain what the model is doing, I, I think helps a lot. I have seen, I, I often use Gen AI just personally for when I've got to write manual code. And, and, and often you have to patch things together when you're going into deployments. Now, really good ML ops, uh, you don't have to do that, but there's always those damn exceptions. Um, and what I've seen is uh, some of our engineers doing this for, how do we connect to this server. I haven't done this type of server before. What are the connection settings? I want to do this, this, and this. Or translate, I've got this connection setting for Snowflake. How would I do the same thing for Databricks? So it's particularly useful when you want to switch from one thing to another, uh, where you want to set the security settings, or when you just want... And, and my favorite, because I'm not an engineer, what does that error message mean? <laughs> Uh, and and uh, we're, we're try, try doing some uh, research at the moment. How can we use it to recommend to us what to do when the data drifts? That's always the problem. The world keeps changing. Uh, can we help it to quickly pop up some recommendations after we've noticed data drift? What could we do about that? Yeah, and, and uh, you know, could it generate some, some sample data or, or, or some settings for us to, to, to fix that as a quick fix? And also being able to identify the difference between data drift and concept drift, where maybe the world is changing, but the actual data is the same, but the conceptual applications and the semantics yes. around it are shifting as well. Yeah, and possibly suggest to us why that's happening and what we could do about it. Yes. And then... Given the fact that as you are incorporating generative AI, and as we addressed earlier, it's not always going to give you correct answers, even though it thinks they might be correct. 
what are the elements of risk and some of the risk mitigation controls that need to be understood and applied in the process of bringing generative AI into that inner loop of development and deployment? Um, I, I think you should always treat it with suspicion, not because it's particularly worse than anything else, but it's a bit of a catch because it's, it's designed to look like a, and act, behave like a human. And we tend to trust humans more than we should. So we're likely to trust a Gen AI more than we should. So I'm a great fan of putting in validation rules. Uh, so we were talking about what do you do at prediction time? There should be, you know, you should be able to define predictions should always lie in this range here. You know? If it's outside of that, there's a problem. So if I've got a patient temperature and it tells me the patient temperature is one degree, I should be able to flag that. That just doesn't make sense, you know. So a whole bunch of validity rules. I need to be make very clear which version of a Gen AI I'm using at any point of time and for different use cases, who's using what version. Now, that, that whole version control, it, it can become quite a, a problem when you're in a big organization, by the way, using many Gen AIs uh, and changing them over time. The downstream consequences. So if a version changes, you now have to flag that your features are going to be different and that your model needs to be retrained. Um, because if it's pulling out different values or suggesting different values, your model isn't trained on those. As I said before, because it's, this is stochastic, um, sometimes it's good to run it more than once uh, and see how varied the answers are. And to that point also of model versions and also different models specifically, I'm wondering if there are any useful uh, guidelines or evaluation criteria that you have found for saying, okay, for this particular problem statement, we're going to use OpenAI GPT 3.5. For this one over here, we're going to use Llama 2. For this third one, we're going to use Falcon. Just wondering, what are some of the criteria for being able to say, okay, these are the capabilities that I need. This is how I'm going to decide which of these models I'm going to use and whether it's going to be an open source model that I self-host or a managed model that I'm just going to call via an API. I gotta say, I'm not sophisticated enough to know that in advance. Every time I've had to do that, it's an experiment. <laughs> um, you know, I, I try them all, well, all the ones that I've got access to, which one may, is, may, is getting me the results I want most reliably. Um, there are times though, there are other criteria. I was dealing with a company that supports here in Singapore, the, the military. Well, guess what? They can't use chat GPT their data can't leave their server. So this is where we talk to companies like Hugging Face, where you can you know, host locally. In other cases, it's um, they're on an Amazon stack. Um, so they, you know, they want to use a, uh, a Gen AI that's on the same platform. They don't want to switch between or they're on a Microsoft one. So they want to use Copilot. That's also about minimizing data movement as well. Uh, because that can change latency and it always causes security problems. Yeah, I, I, I uh, know one of the guys at uh, Hugging Face, um, a guy called Rajiv Shah. He makes the coolest uh, social media videos. And, and he talks about how having a specialist Gen AI uh, can be cheaper, faster, and outperform the, the generic ones. In your experience of working at FeatureByte, working with customers, experimenting with these generative AI capabilities for the purpose of developing and deploying and maintaining AI pipelines and their respective models, what are some of the most interesting or innovative or unexpected ways that you have seen those capabilities applied? I once asked to, to suggest some features that was for credit card fraud. And I thought I was pretty good at credit card fraud. And I'm not going to say I'm a world-class expert, but I thought I knew enough. And one of the features it popped out was it said, filter it, filter the data, the transaction data, to find reversals, transaction reversals. I'm going, why? And I, and, and I got it, and I got it to give me an explanation. And it says, uh, that's one of the ways that people actually do money laundering in certain other ways. And then they make the reversal a different amount to the original amount. I go, oh, yeah, now you say it that actually makes sense to me. 
but you know, it, it is good that Gen AI can actually teach you something about the domain you work in at times because it's had access to what people have published elsewhere. So that was that was particularly cool. As I said before, the healthcare one I quite liked. Um, thank goodness they're working off typed data and not uh, handwritten doctor's data. I'm not, not sure there's an AI in the world that can interpret doctor's handwriting. We, we need more pharmacists to do that for us. Um, and then the other place I've seen it used is in um, making synthetic data. Uh, and then there's a lot of reasons you might want to use this, uh, but one of them is just to uh, rebalance the data for fairness purposes. You might have some HR hiring data and it's in the tech industry and almost all of it is for males, but you wanna make your model work for females. If you don't put in more female data, the, your optimization won't care less about the fit for females. Um, so that's one of the things where I've seen it and it actually out, it became much fairer without losing any accuracy which is the thing that surprised me. Because I always think of that, that, it, that fairness is a trade-off against accuracy, but it doesn't have to be if you've got a good Gen AI making the right synthetic data for you. And in your own experience of doing this work and exploring these newfound capabilities of Gen AI models and how they can be applied to the development loop for other machine learning projects, what are the most interesting or unexpected or challenging lessons that you've learned personally? I've learned that Gen AI is an idiot savant. Um, it can be quite brilliant, but it, there's, it has these huge blind spots. If I don't word my question to it the right way, it's going to tell me something uh, that at times is the exact opposite of what I wanted it to, to, to tell me. So you do have to experiment. That's why we have prompt engineers. I do. I am hoping that Gen AI will get a bit better. You don't. You shouldn't need to be a prompt engineer to get this right. But it is a bit like, um, and it reminds me of I used to be an educator. You've got to make sure you set the context very well before you ask a question. Uh, and it does surprise me at times when I take certain things for granted, and it just doesn't. It doesn't take it for granted. Absolutely. <laughs> and for people who are interested in the capabilities of these generative AI models and they're considering whether to apply it to their problem, what are the cases where you see it as being the wrong choice and you're better off just using the tried and true, hand-coded, just do the development work, do your own thinking, don't let the model sway you one way or another? So the first case I'm going to say is when your use case and the data you're using is very proprietary. There's never been anything like that out in the public domain. So Gen AI only knows what it's seen. And if it's never seen anything like what you're doing, it's not going to know how to do it well. And a lot of business data is like that. You know, there, there are some very common use cases out there, credit, risk, churn, and such. Uh, you're going to get good answers for that. Um, but particularly if your business does things very differently, there's another example does it differently to the rest of the industry, the Gen AI will assume you're like the rest of the industry. So the, 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 that's one case. The next is, um, I think it adds less value when your data is highly structured. Um, and most proprietary data, by the way, is highly structured. Now, not, not all. You get telephone transcripts and you know, things like that. But it adds less value in that case. And when your data is small, then thing I mentioned before, replicability. There are times when replicability is paramount. Don't use Gen AI if replicability is absolutely essential to your use case. Um, and then finally, there's ones where if you can't move data around and there is no proprietary one that you can install locally, Gen AI isn't going to help you at all. Um, They'd be the four cases that I'd say you, know, you really shouldn't use Gen AI. There's probably some more, uh, and there's probably exceptions to the ones I just listed, but it's not the solution to everything. Uh, a clever person can do more with a small amount of data than Gen AI can. 
And as you continue to experiment with and invest in these capabilities in the FeatureByte product, what are some of the things you have planned for the near to medium term or any particular projects or problem areas you're excited to explore? One thing uh, that I'm particularly excited about is trying to use Gen AI to detect anomalies in the data. Because it's got a little bit of general knowledge about what data should look like, ask it whether the data looks right. Uh, and that sort of overlaps to something I said before with data drift. But even before that, just give it some data and go, does, any, does this look right? <laughs> um, everybody hates cleaning data. Everybody hates looking after data quality. Um, so we're starting to experiment with that. You know, I, it's going to be a bit of work. Um, uh, Gen AI has bit, bit hit and miss on, on what it thinks is reasonable. Uh, but another thing that we're looking at is not requiring people to code if they want to customize a feature. Uh, can you just say in plain English what you want the feature to do, or plain language? We're sticking to English for the moment um, because that's what we're, our company is best at. Although our, one of our founders is French, I'm sure he really wants it to do it in, in French. But yeah, being able to say, look, I want it to filter on this, um, and then I want to count that, and I want to see if it exceeds this threshold. And you should just be able to generate a feature by explaining it in normal language like that without having to write code. So, you know, we're, we're looking at, and that's probably going to require us to fine tune um, some, some uh, code generation Gen AIs uh, because our syntax is not uh, something that a generic uh, Gen AI would know about. So to me, they're the two most exciting ones. The, the, the more we can simplify and make things accessible, the more we can flag when something goes wrong and, and figure out why, uh, the better life is for all of us, including the data scientists who like to code. Are there any other aspects of the work that you're doing at FeatureByte or this overall space of applying generative AI capabilities to the development, deployment, and maintenance process for AI and ML projects that we didn't discuss yet that you'd like to cover before we close out the show? One thing I, I do want to try Gen AI for is for load testing. And can I, can I generate a ton of data or some extreme data? that I can then run through my system and get it to deliberately generate stuff that'll be problematic. Do it at scale, do it with variation. Because I, when I've seen testing in the past, people just replicate the same data over and over again. And you're not really stress testing uh, because you haven't done enough situations. You're going to find more edge cases if you get the Gen AI to generate data for testing for you. All right. Well, for anybody who wants to get in touch with you and follow along with the work that you and your team are doing, I'll have you add your preferred contact information to the show notes. And as the final question, I'd like to get your perspective on what you see as being the biggest barrier to adoption for machine learning today. Data quality. Everyone's going to agree on this and data availability. Companies come to you and they say, oh, I've got data and you have a look at it. And literally, uh, one of the companies I spoke to, it was a scanned set of uh, into PDFs of, of physical paper, and it had been doctors writing on physical pieces of paper. And I'm going, that's not data. No. <laughs> that's almost abstract art. <laughs> so what people think of as data is often not data. And the volume of data you need to do machine learning at the moment is, is still a bit onerous for smaller companies. Well, thank you very much for taking the time today to join me and share the work that you and your team at FeatureByte are doing. Definitely a very interesting space as we continue to see how these generative AI capabilities can be applied to different problem spaces. So appreciate the time and energy that you folks are putting into that and bringing it to bear on the problem of building more AI. Uh, so thank you again, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks, Tobias. Thanks for giving me a chance to talk about things that I'm passionate about.
Thank you for listening, and don't forget to check out our other shows, the Data Engineering Podcast, which covers the latest in modern data management, and Podcasts.init, which covers the Python language, its community, and the innovative ways it is being used. You can visit the site at themachinelearningpodcast.com to subscribe to the show, sign up for the mailing list, and read the show notes. And if you've learned something or tried out a project from the show, then tell us about it. Email hosts at themachinelearningpodcast.com with your story. To help other people find the show, please leave a review on Apple Podcasts and tell your friends and coworkers.